in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, now I'm going to continue this morning with our lesson on, uh, on the uh, demonic world, and um, I want to read an email I got from a man who's in New York. He's a, uh, he's a retired uh, prison guard, so uh, he sees everything. Um, I probably, of all the jobs in the world, a prison guard probably got one of, the, one of the hardest jobs that you'll ever find. Here's what he said. I wrote to you some time back and told you about an experience I had as a New York State Correction Officer in Gowanda State Prison. It was about a possessed inmate that walked backwards without tripping or hitting anything. Now, do you figure? That happened. I mean, the man said it happened. He saw it, witnessed it. And of course, you know, you try to do that on your own and you're gonna hit something, you're gonna stumble, you're gonna fall. But uh, he walked backwards. And of course, the reason he did is because there's a spiritual element there that is greater than the flesh. And what we're talking about is the spiritual element today that is far greater than the flesh. Let me give you an illustration. If you've been born again, if you have truly been saved, there is a spirit residing in you that is eminently greater than your flesh. That's the Holy Ghost. And all life, as we understand it, all life, all life, comes from the Spirit of God. It doesn't originate from itself. And so therefore, the Lord said in John chapter number 3, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He said except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Turn there with me, John 3. I hadn't planned on doing this, but I thought, well, while I'm at it, let's just look at that for a moment. John chapter number 3. All right. Verse 5, Jesus answered, he's talking to Nicodemus, John 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Immediately, the Protestant theologians jump on that and say, oh, that's water baptism. <coughs> See, they say that's water baptism, to be born of water. Now go to verse 6. Now look at the comparison. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. All right, if you're going to take verse 6 and compare it to verse 5, what would the flesh be? Born of what? Water. And verse number 6, the Spirit is born of the Holy Spirit of God. In plainer words, a natural birth, a human being that has been born as human beings are born. And if you know anything about biology, you know that there's a water associated with the birth of a human being. And uh, a, a physician will do that in, in preparation for delivery if it doesn't happen naturally. So you have, uh, you have that which is born of the water, in other words, a real human being, and then that which is born of the spirit, born of the spirit of the living God. There's a lot of things in the Bible that, I um, uh, don't know how to put this, best way I know how to say it is, uh, sometimes the Bible doesn't say things to match your culture or, your, uh, or, the, or, the, or the, the, uh, the controlling uh, thought of the day. It just lays it out. It just says it the way it is. The Bible is a book that covers thousands of years of human history. And so when it says something like this, it's talking about uh, the fact that uh, there are things in this world that you better look very carefully at. John 8, 44, the Lord said to these Jews, he said, you are of your father, the devil. <coughs> Someone said, well, now, spiritually they were. Well, no doubt they were. But when he talked about Judas Iscariot, he said, have not chosen you 12, and one of you is a devil. He's talking about Judas. So uh, there's some things in the Bible that just make you think. And that's all I'll, I'll say about that right now. Just make you think. And that's what I want you to do. You don't have to agree with me. 
I'm not asking you to agree with me. Now, when I sit in a class, and I've been in a lot of classes, listening to a lot of lectures and professors and so forth, I don't have to agree with what the man's saying, but I'll listen with an open mind. And then I'll go home and I'll do some research on my own and some praying, study, and dig into it. And sometimes I don't come to a conclusion overnight, and sometimes I don't force a conclusion. I allow something to develop in my soul and pray for light and ask God to give me light. And uh, he has seen fit to do that by the grace of God. Uh, what I'm teaching you this morning was not arrived at overnight. A lot of these things, it took me years and years to learn. Uh, <clears throat> the church I was saved in, most of the people in that church, or at least a lot of them, took the cavalier, laid-back attitude about demons that, uh, oh, well, you know, that was the prevailing thought of 2,000 years ago, and these people were uh, ignorant, and they were uh, redneck people that didn't, weren't educated, and, and, you know, they were just simply following the, uh, uh, the, the culture of their day, and if they, had re if they had known what we know today, they certainly wouldn't believe in evil spirits. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe in them. I believe in them. And uh, when the Bible says that uh, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, cast them out and spoke directly to them, uh, he's not trying to make anybody feel good. He's speaking directly to the demon. The reason he's speaking directly to the demon, because the demon is an, is a, an intelligent spirit being. Now, I gave you last week, we started in some of these in the Old Testament, and I'll finish up with them because I've got a lot of other ground I want to cover with you this morning. But uh, to to uh, uh, summarize what I'm talking about, uh, the Old Testament deals with people who communicate with the dead, who perform magic spells, who use potions, amulets, uh, stones, all kinds of different things they use that have uh, that, appear, that apparently have power in them. Uh, these people have ability to, to uh, create, in the sense I'll use that in a loose sense, like Moses and Aaron when their rod turned to a serpent. Uh, they could do the same thing. Uh, a lot of these things, therefore, you, could, you have to take them on the face values, what the Bible says. I believe the Bible. And it'll help you a great deal if you believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. And uh, so in the Old Testament, they communicated with dead people, necromancy. They communicated with dead people in the sense that they, dead people communicated back with them, familiar spirits. But you and I both understand that when you're dead and you're gone from this earth, you're not communicating with anybody. These are demons. These are familiar spirits. All of this stuff's going on in the Old Testament. And uh, the people were offering up their children. To, as sacrifices, as human sacrifices to appease their gods. Uh, on the walls in the Canaanite tombs, they have found some of the most hideous stuff that is imaginable to a human being. And this was the kind of religion that Israel had to deal with when they went into the Holy Land. And God wanted them completely segregated from their surroundings. He, wanted, he didn't want them to have anything to do with the gods of the Canaanites or the gods of the Egyptians or any of the other gods. For he was the true and living God, Jehovah, the Lord God, Jehovah, the only God there is. And the truth that he revealed to Israel was revealed to them. And they were to be the, uh, the ones who got it out to the rest of the world. So this is what's going on in the Old Testament. So when the Lord Jesus shows up 2,000 years ago, he had to deal with all that. As I told you before, the, uh, uh, the Talmud, I mentioned this to you last week, the Babylonian Talmud if you lay it down next to the New Testament, you will be amazed at how much the Talmud, the Talmud, is in agreement with pagan, ignorant philosophies as it relates to demons, witchcraft, uh, uh, magic potions, casting out, casting spells on people, and all the stuff that go along with it. The Babylonian Talmud, you could just, you could take up uh, Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, or any of the rest of that stuff. <clears throat> and take the Talmud and lay it down next to it, and you're essentially reading the same thing. But the New Testament is not like that. The New Testament is as far removed from that pagan, ignorant culture as it could possibly be. For the New Testament deals with these creatures, these demons, on an entirely different level. It deals with them in the sense that they are intelligent spirit beings that are subject to the name of Christ, that in the power of the finished work of Christ with the, through the blood, that there is authority and power over them, 
that they want to inhabit a body. They don't like to be cast out into the abyss or to the deep. And so when he cast them out of the man who was called Legion, they went into a herd of swine, a body, and they ran over a steep slope, and they were uh, the bodies of the, of, the, of the swine were killed, and so the demon was released again to go out and find a body. If you remember, the Lord told about a demon leaving a man, unclean spirit. He went out, and he came back, and when he came back, he brought seven spirits, more wicked than himself. And the, and the latter state of that man was worse than it was in the beginning. So uh, this is where the New Testament deals with demons. It doesn't get into the idea that you can sprinkle salt on the ground or you can cast something over your shoulder or you, can, you have to worry about a certain time of the day or uh, how many demons will fit on the head of a pen and all this stuff. New Testament doesn't get into that because it, that's not, that's, that's not a revelation from God. That's pagan superstition. And so this is the New Testament as compared to that. Now, how many ever heard of the New Age movement? The New Age movement, all right. Uh, about 30 years ago, the New Age movement was uh, when they opened up East Town, for example. Uh, I don't know if you were around when they opened up East Town, but there was a store over there that was full of crystals and all kinds of New Age paraphernalia. You could go in that store. They had the music, had the crystals, had all the stuff. And uh, that, was at, that was at East Town when it, was, when it first opened. And the reason it did is because about that time, the age of Aquarius was dawning. The musical hair, you know, the fifth dimension, singing that song was real popular. And so people were fascinated, a novelty to them. It's not that they really cared about being spiritual, most of them. It was just a novelty, something to play with, tinker with, something new. And that's how a lot of people get drawn into stuff like this. But then the New Age movement was, uh, was moving about. A lot of preachers began to preach about it. And they preached about it because of the effect it might have on the church. And then essentially the New Age movement kind of morphed. It just kind of withdrew from the, from the, from the uh, forefront and kind of morphed. It kind of changed a little bit, but it's still the New Age movement. Constance, Con Constance Cumby, an attorney, wrote a book called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. I read that book about 30 years ago. It's an outstanding book. You can, I'm sure you can still get it today. And she did an outstanding job of researching the New Age movement. If you get a hold of the get a hold of it, the uh, hidden dangers of the rainbow. That was, the, uh, that was the, uh, uh, the title of the book by Constance Cumby. Now, 30 years later, what does the rainbow represent? It represents, somebody said it, what? Sodomy. And they've, uh, they have, uh, they have, t they have uh, used it now as, as a representative of their movement. So the rainbow in the scripture, when it started back in the book of Genesis, what did it represent? It represented God's faithfulness to never again destroy this earth with water. All right, that was all good. But now look what they've done to it. You see how this thing progresses? And that's where we are today. But uh, 30 years ago, the rainbow did not represent sodomy. 30 years ago, the rainbow was the New Age movement. And so now, of course, it's changed. New Age movement is in is in full uh, full in full battle array. It's moving <coughs> like you wouldn't believe. Now, how many know what an avatar is? You see this thing all the time. I didn't have a clue what an avatar was till I looked it up. <laughs> because I don't think the words in the Bible. <laughs> have you found avatar anywhere in the Bible? All right. Here's what it, they say an avatar is. It is a manifestation of a deity or released soul in bodily form on earth, an incarnate divine teacher. All right, now that's the classic Hindu definition of an avatar. Now just keep that in the back of your mind, the idea of an avatar. Now before we jump to the New Age movement, I want to give you some of the messages that they're getting from uh, outer space. UFOs. There is a connection. All of this stuff is interconnected. It is amazing at what they're saying. Returning to the cosmic laws as taught by great masters such as Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, all of whom are said to have come from other planets. They're avatars. 
Jesus is an avatar to the New Age movement, to these occultists. You remember what the definition of an avatar? An avatar is a manifestation of a deity or released soul in bodily form on earth, an incarnate divine teacher. Now remember something. It's very, very important to remember this. It's the little word semantics. You say God, I say God, God to you, God to me are not the same thing. You say salvation, I say salvation, salvation to you, salvation to me is not the same thing. You've got to always remember when you're reading this material and what these people have to say, they may use scriptural terminology. You may think they're talking about the same thing you are, but they are not. When they use the term deity, they're not talking about the one true living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the only God there is. They're talking about spirit beings manifesting themselves on this earth. And the word deity to them doesn't mean what deity means to you. There's only one that deity fits, to, folks. That's God. But not to them. So that's very important to remember that. In plainer words, they classify Jesus, Buddha, Krishna on the same, in the same, on the same plane, categorized the same way. Listen to this. The millions that come from other worlds, from far off galaxies, to assist in bringing peace upon earth have my staunch support and backing for all their endeavors. I am Sananda, known to you as Jesus the Christ. I am Sananda, and this is my message to the world. See this? This thing is identifying itself as our Lord Jesus Christ under a different name with a different message. One of today's most infamous abductees is formerly known as Claude Verillihorn, but now goes by the name Rael. And like we saw from another alien encounter earlier, Rael's aliens also claim to be humanity's creators. They pose as scientists or designers from Rael's book called The True Face of God. Quote, the creators, alien scientists also known as Eloha or Elohim, therefore arranged for a child to be born of a woman of the earth and one of their own people, aliens. The child in question, Jesus Christ, would thereby inherit certain telepathic fac faculties which humans lack. Mary was the woman chosen. One of the creator's aliens appeared to explain that Mary would bring forth a son of God. This is from the True Face of God, page 60. There's a message here, folks. Listen carefully. We're going to quote Rael again. Claude Vorilhan claimed that in December of 73 he was renamed Rael by aliens. Rael claims that he is the result of a virgin birth. Alien named Yahweh told him, We decided the time had come to send a new messenger on earth. Says Jesus was scientifically revived by other aliens and taken back to the Elohim planet says Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world. Jesus' purpose on earth was to help us advance scientifically and medically to make room for the return of the Elohim to the planet. This is from UFO Cults and the New Millennium. Going back to the 50s, contactee George Van Tassel had aliens telling him things similar to the modern claims of Rael. And contactee Bonnie Meyer whom we've been reading from already. He, George Van Tassel, said that Jesus was born of Mary, who was a space person, sent here already pregnant in order to show people, earth people, the proper way to live. He said the space people have watched over us through the years and have tried to help us. The author of this little uh, expose here says that he lived in Roswell, New Mexico for 11 years. Now, how many understand how important Roswell is. 1947, okay. In Roswell, New Mexico, for 11 years as a missionary to present orthodox biblical views 
to those who go there with belief systems similar to what I've been describing. Now, he said, I used to believe that my target audience, so to speak, was a very tiny niche group of people, limited mainly just to those who were having direct contact with ETs who, who were joining UFO cults. However, I've had so many conversations that what you'd otherwise call normal people over the years, I've been surprised and nearly sickened to find out how many people in the mainstream are beginning to think about the Bible in the exact same ways that I've been quoting you today, but without joining a cult or having contact experiences. Now let me put this in context. Fifty years ago, the average man on the street that hardly went to church knows more than people who go to church every Sunday. More Bible. Knows more Bible than people who go to church every Sunday. We are living in an abysmally ignorant generation of the Word of God. This is why the church services today are completely built on experience instead of a person. So, what we've done now, what's happening now, is 50 years later, the churches are full of people who are gullible to anything if it sounds spiritual. So enter the History Channel. How many know what I'm talking about, the History Channel? Before I read what the History Channel has done on UFOs, I want to tell you who owns it. I looked this up. It's owned by two entities. One is the Hearst Corporation, the product of Randolph Hearst, the, the newspaper publisher in California, 50%. The other 50% is by, guess what, Disney. Walt Disney's owns the other 50% of the History Channel. Now, folks, the History Channel has done a thing on UFOs. Listen to the narrative, the two minutes as they bring this thing on. This is what people are watching, and this is what the mainstream in America now accepts. Quote, the Bible, a sacred text filled with fantastic tales of an awesome supernatural force. But what if that wasn't God? What if it was a UFO? In Ezekiel, what was that gleaming wheel within a wheel that descended on the prophet? In the Sodom and Gomorrah of Genesis, where did the devastating fire and brimstone come from? In Exodus, what was that presence in the sky that led Moses through the desert? Were these the actions of God? Or might these mysterious forces in the sky have been UFOs in the Bible? You understand what they're doing. They're planting seeds. <laughs> Throughout the Bible, mysterious aerial phenomena appear and alter the course of human history. To religious scholars, these stories are an infallible record of God's presence and godly events. But some modern-day researchers offer a different theory. Perhaps these stories really describe alien visitations. Barry Downing. Quote, is it possible that extraterrestrials have been involved in human history for thousands of years? And if so, did they have contact with the biblical people? And as you look in the Bible, there are many reports of UFOs that contact biblical people. A chariot of fire that abducts Elijah and takes him off into the sky? Narrator, quote, Elijah was one of the most revered Jewish prophets of his day. According to UFOologists, the biblical account of his encounter with chariots of fire is a detailed description of what might be termed a UFO, unquote. The History Channel, UFOs in the Bible. Now, for the gullible and for those who don't know the Bible, that sounds plausible. And it creates interest because it is mysterious. And it also has a certain amount of... Uh, of uh, adventure attached to it. And they've heard about UFOs, and they've heard about UFO contactees and messages that are coming from UFOs. And so it sparks their interest. And of course, the purpose of that is to suck you in, is to draw you in, and then, be and then begin to manipulate your thinking and your mind and plant doubt about the Bible as if they have an answer to what the Scripture has to say. Now, don't you think it's an amazing thing, though, in uh, this is 2015 now, that in the year 2015, that there is so much interest in the Bible. You know why? Because the Bible is a book that is different from every other book. And they want to 
pick at it, snipe at it, pick here, pick there, pick here, pick there. And though instead of just coming up and denying what the Bible says, they change it and make a different application of it. That sounds plausible. I mean, after all, when Elijah left the earth, the Bible said a chariot of fire appeared. He was in the chariot of fire. Elisha saw him go up, and he saw the mantle of God fall down. He picked it up, smote the river, and walked across. I believe that. I don't believe it was a UFO. I believe it was a, fire, a chariot of fire prepared by the Lord God. I believe when they crossed the Red Sea, an east wind blew, parted the sea, an east wind blew, dried the ground, and they walked across on dry ground. And when Pharaoh and his chariots and his army and his troops got out in the middle of that ocean, uh, it came in on them and drowned them. And now they have found chariot, by the way, they found chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea. How'd they get there? I believe that the fire that rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah was, if you want to call it supernatural, God made it, wherever you want, it doesn't bother, it doesn't bother me. God simply f sent fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah. He burned them. He burned them and uh, consumed them there. So uh, I believe that. Was it a UFO? No. Was it little green men? No. None of that. Little green men are demons, folks. UFOs are a material phenomena that demons, a spirit world, is capable of producing. It's real, but it's not real in the sense that that's real. God made the tree that this is made from. He made the oak tree. I'd say, I'd say that's oak. He made the oak tree that this pulpit was made from. But what the demons are producing is a phenomena that uh, doesn't fit in any of these categories. It's real, but it's not real like this is real. Okay? So in that sense, I believe in UFOs, but I do not believe they came from up here. I believe they came from down here. I believe there's something under our feet. The Bible says that hell is in the heart of the earth. If you'll remember when the witch of Endor confronted Samuel, it was, let's put it this way, was confronted by Samuel. That's a better way to say it. He obviously was superior to her. She said she saw something descending and ascending out of the ground. Remember? Descending and ascending out of the ground. So what's beneath us, there is something there, according to Revelation 9, the bottomless pit opens, and when it opens up, these creatures come up out of the bottomless pit. They're coming up out of the earth. They're coming up from, from beneath us. Uh, science tells us that the center of the earth is a, is a molten, uh, is, is, is the core of the earth is molten rock, and, you know, just a pure fire. Well, I don't know how much, you know, I, I, regardless of what they say, I believe the Bible. <coughs> and I believe that hell is down there. And I believe one, one day, hell down there is going to be taken and cast into a lake of fire and brimstone out here somewhere where God's going to create it. And hell is going to be cast into it. Now, that's what the Bible says, and that's what I believe. These UFOs, therefore, uh, have, a, have a fanatic following. Uh, they're fanatic. There's a couple of websites that I, can, I could lead you to that all they talk about is UFOs. And the UFO has the answer to everything. And they see them everywhere all the time. Uh, that's, that's a side issue with me. That's not that important to me. Uh, if, if a thousand UFOs showed up over, over, over UT Stadium over here next time they played football, uh, it wouldn't bother me. That That's no big deal. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to me. We're living in an age of deception. What matters to me is what they're doing with the message of Jesus Christ, Amen. the gospel of the Son of God. That's what's important. <laughs> all right? Now, I'm going to show you. We're going to start making connections. The New Age movement. What then do the New Age prophets teach? Helen Petrovna Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, Robert Mueller, Barbara Harks Hubbard, Neil Donald Walsh, David Spangler, Matthew Fox. Let them speak for themselves. The avatars of the New Age say that humanity is God and that there is no death. Barbara Marx Hubbard states the creed of the serpent succinctly, quote, we are immortal. We are not bound by the limits of the body. We can create new life forms and new worlds. We are gods. That's strong talk, isn't it? We're gods, she says. Neil Donald Walsh says the same, quote, 
Trust God, or if you wish, trust yourself, for thou art God. Now did the serpent say to Eve, thou shalt be as... You remember that? Uh, his spirit guide denies death, saying, now they all have spirit guides, by the way. You remember what I told you about the spirit guide? Let's quickly run back through it. You have this oneness, this spirit being, emanations coming forth from him. Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, uh, Sophia, all right. In the Old Testament, you have Jehovah, who is a demiurge, a lesser God, created from Sophia, had problems. He came forth from Sophia. He creates archons. These archons are devils, demons, whatever, to do his work. And he is a petty, jealous God. The Old Testament God of the Hebrew is just a little petty, know nothing, doesn't realize he's created. He thinks he's the creator. And in order to get around him and get back to the one, you need a spirit guide. And that spirit guide will direct you to this oneness. And you become, you, you understand you're, you're the enlightened, you're the elite. If you have the spirit guide, the spirit guide's going to teach you things and show you how to get around the God of the Old Testament. So all gurus, all New Age prophets, all these people in the occult world who think they have this great knowledge that you don't have, they all have spirit guides. You know what their spirit guide is? It's a demon. It's a demon. And remember, the root word demon, it means intelligence. That's what it means. It doesn't mean wicked. It just simply means intelligence. And if you remember that Plato uh, and some of these old Greek philosophers taught that to have a demon was a good thing because you could have intelligence by having it. It was, they say only later on, they begin to take on a wicked form like it does. This is why I say to you, I do not know where demons came from. I gave you about five or six possibilities. I do not know where they came from, but I know they are real. I know they are real. And it could be one of the five or six that I gave you. It could be, the, it could be one of them. I don't know. It could be the, it could be the spirits of a pre-Adamite race. That was on this earth before. It could be the spirits of these, uh, of these Nephilim, these giants that were killed in the flood. It could be. It could be a number of things. But I don't know what they I just know this. I know that I don't, know if, I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I know I'm protected by the blood of Christ. I know they're real. I don't make fun of them. I don't mess with them. And I don't want them messing with me. And, and they do. And when they start messing with me, I deal with them personally. I speak directly to them. And I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I plead the blood over you. Leave me. Yeah. And they will leave you. They will leave you. Don't entertain them. Don't give them a place. Don't, don't, don't try to outsmart them. Don't think you're going to be coy with them. They're smarter than us. So don't mess with them. Just do exactly what Michael did when he dealt with Satan over the body of, of Moses. You know what he did? He said, the Lord rebuked thee, Satan. Yeah. That's what he said. And that ended it. It was over. And so that's the thing to do. You don't mess with them. They're real. Uh, his spirit guide denies death, saying that there is no death. Life goes on forever and ever. Life is. You simply change form. Alice Bailey said, we are all gods, all the children of the one father. As the latest of the avatars, the Christ has told us, these New Age teachers repeat the lies. Now, who is Alice Bailey? See how they come together? She called him an avatar. Who was Alice Bailey? Who was Hela Petrovna Blavatsky? Remember I've told you? She was the woman, the Russian, who started the Theosophist Society, the Theosophist. And she published a magazine. The first few years of the publication, I don't remember exactly how long it was. You know what she called it? Lucifer. Remember what I've told you about Lucifer? He's one of the emanations from, from that spirit being. I hope this doesn't confuse you, but folks, this stuff comes together. It starts making sense after a while. If you can make sense out of it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It, it's, it's people that, are, that refuse the book. When you refuse the Bible, when you reject the Bible, what's left for you? Confusion. Confusion. This is the only, this is the only book in the world that will get your mind right. Tell you where you came from, where you're going, how to get there. It's the only book in the world that will do that. Alice Bailey was the, I think she was an American, she was the American uh, disciple of Blavatsky. 
And she and I think a Colonel Walcott pushed this theosophy into America. And folks, the New Age movement is nothing in the world more than an outgrowth of theosophy. And what you see today going on in the churches, take another step forward. What have you got in the churches? Oh, it's so, it's, uh, uh, I've got that for, uh, let me see. It will, uh, it will, it will, uh, it will amaze you. All right, I'll read one. I hate to do this, but I'll take this right here from uh, a future. Here we go. Now listen carefully. Listen to this. This is what's going on right now in the churches in America. Folks, I'm talking about church. I must add, though, that I don't believe making disciples must equal making adherence to the Christian religion. It may be advisable in many, not all, circumstances to help people become followers of Jesus and remain within their Buddhist, Hindu, or Jewish context. Now put that together with what I just said. Okay, that man calls himself a Christian. He's up sitting on his stool week in and week out uh, addressing a congregation of people as if they're in a Christian church. And he just told you that, oh, you can be a Buddhist and you can be a Hindu. You can be, you can be whatever you want to be and still love Jesus. You know why he says that? Because Jesus is an avatar to him. He no more believes that the Lord Jesus Christ is almighty God than a dog. It's why it's so important that when you preach Christ, he makes all the difference in a church. If you preach Christ as to who he really is, it's going to divide people. He divided them 2,000 years ago. He's still dividing people. He forces you to make a decision. You can't have him and have your religion. You have him and they're out the door with your religion. So, uh, this New Age movement, this fellow that said this would, would, would never say, I am a follower of Blavatsky or Bailey, or I, I believe in the New Age movement. Not at all. But that's exactly what he preaches. He preaches their doctrine. So what does that mean? Well, it means he's either ignorant of the source of what he's preaching. Well, I, don't, I doubt that. I think he knows what he's talking about. I, th I think he knows where it came from. Or he is willfully deceptive. He's deceiving the people. And that's exactly where it's going. That's what's happening right now. They're being deceived. So what happened? Let's just take a step back and take a broad look at it. The New Age movement, the New Age movement morphed. In plain words, it changed its outward form. It changed its outward form so that it could assimilate, which means that it just became part of the theological thinking of the ministers in the churches without them really understanding the underlying principle of what they were giving out from the pulpits. And by doing that, it has infiltrated the churches. This right here was handed to me by a brother. Brother Williams handed me this just a few moments ago. This is a denominational divide. A Presbyterian church splits over same-sex marriage. The pastor of this church, I don't, I, don't know the, I don't know the man, but from all indication is he's a brother because he rejected same-sex marriage and resigned from the church. And so the church, if that's what you want to call it, continues on. In, uh, in its apostasy. Now, you say, what's that got to do with the New Age movement? Everything. If we're all God, what make a difference in sexuality? If we're all God, either we are or we aren't. This pantheism, of course. There's nothing new about that. That's the old pantheism just revived in modern lingo. Uh, then you can understand how that these emerging church, the people who preach the garbage that I just told you just now, these people are openly embracing sodomy in their churches. They're openly embracing it. Birds of a feather flock together, folks. Put two and two together. If these churches can openly embrace sodomy, we're talking about the emerging church movement, their great gurus and their teachers. If they can openly embrace sodomy, then it means they've got the same spirit 
Levesque and all the rest of them. See what I mean about the Lord Jesus Christ? If you read Romans chapter number 1, 1 Timothy 1.10, 1 Corinthians 6, nine. if you read Leviticus chapter number 18 and read it with an open mind and read it plainly, what does it say? It is as clear as it can be. It condemns sodomy from day one to the end. It's incompatible. There's no way in the world. Does it go on in the church? Absolutely. Does it go on here at Temple? It may very well be. But it's sure not going to be, it's sure not going to be condoned from the pulpit. That's the difference. The Lord only knows what all is going on at Temple. <laughs> but you're not going to hear me get up here and, and say, well, it's okay. That's the difference. You preach the book. And when people come and they hear it, after a while they may come under conviction and get right with God. That's, that's what we're here for. That's what I'm up here doing. It, but the one that I exalt and lift up more than anything, I don't myself exalt it. I'm going to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, for he yeah. is the answer to our problem. He is not an avatar. He is not an emanation. He is the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the universe, and the only Savior of mankind. Now, what I just said in that last statement right there is so repulsive to most of the religious character in America today that you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe. This preacher right here that left this church, God bless him. I pray God gives him a place now, opens up somewhere for him to go. A Presbyterian here, he said, enough of this. I'm not going to condone sodomy. I'm out of here. Apparently, obviously, from the, from the indication is that there, from the church, more were against him than were for him, for him to leave like that. So where do you go? You've heard of the term slippery slope. Once you get on the slippery slope, down you go. And the only way to go when you walk away from the Lord God is down. And the only way to go is into the darkness. And so I'll say to you this morning, Temple Baptist Church, by the grace of God, stick to what you've got. Yeah. Stick to the truth. It's my responsibility to make you aware of how bad the apostasy is and what the Bible has to say about it and how you can deal with it. That's my responsibility. It's your responsibility once you've had it is to what you're going to do with it. Are you going to, are you going to, are you going to stand your ground? It'll cost you something. It's not, it's not cheap and it's not free. But if you're going to stand your ground, you're going to say, no, I love you. If you're a sodomite, I love you. I want to help you, but I don't condone what you're doing. It's not going to work. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Brother Roger Lee, this message.
I'm the guy in school that on library day, when I would go to check out library books, I was checking out books on Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, UFOs, and mysteries. I just had a mind that I wanted to know things that nobody else knew. I wanted to know secret things. I wanted, I wanted that. I, I just, you know, God just prepares you for what you're going to do in life. And, and that's how it was with me. And so I, I think just because I've thought this way all my life, I think different than some other people do. And uh, um, it's exciting when I get one of those eureka moments when it all connects. And John was with me yesterday when it, when it just, there it was. And he saw the excitement on me. And that's, that's where I like uh, finding things out in life. So, you know, a, most of what I do is just God, God has just lifted the veil in my mind on certain things. I don't know everything. And uh, I don't know that I want to know everything or, or that I can know everything. But I believe that I hold everything that is known right here. I hold it right here. And if I, if I do anything on anything, any conferences I do or anything like that, I, I want people to go to the Scriptures, go to the Bible, go to the Bible, go to the Bible. I'm going to uncover for you tonight a secret that it is the biggest secret in the world in history. It is the absolute biggest secret in all of history. Uh, wars have been fought over this secret. People have been killed who have either revealed or threatened to reveal this secret. And it is a secret that I found out is, to my knowledge, is not written down anywhere except one place. And I'm going to show you tonight where you can find this secret at. Okay? Um, but I want to start out uh, going to Scripture. Take your Bible. I want you to turn to two places. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and Psalm chapter 2. Deuteronomy 18 and Psalm chapter 2. Now I have a, as I, as I talked to you a while ago, I have a prevailing philosophy in my mind. And that is, the Bible is the absolute, complete record of everything that is. Do you believe that tonight? Say amen. amen. So, if I need help in life, should I really go on the Dr. Phil show? Because if I really, the kind of help, listen, the kind of help I, I need, Dr. Phil cannot help me with. Okay? I mean, I might like his Texas drawl, but Dr. Phil cannot save me from what's really my biggest problem. Nor can he save you. Can I hear you say amen? amen. The greatest questions I've ever had, I've not found help on Oprah, Dr. Laura, Paul Harvey, Rush Limbaugh, or anybody else. The greatest problems and the greatest questions I've ever had, I've always been able to find them in the Scriptures. I tried to get you to across at least one idea last night, that the Bible is the book of life. And it's not just the book of life, it is the book of your life. How, how many of you have ever done this? A prevailing problem in your life, a trial, a tribulation taking place. God, I need help. Show me answers. You took your Bible, opened it, and there it was. Raise your hand. And when you read I mean, the doodads just go up and down your back. Amen? Amen? That's because God not only knows where everything is in His Bible, He knows how to make you turn to it. He knows. I believe that. He knows. Listen, I'd rather believe that than to believe somebody said, well, God gave me a dream about you. God gave me a prophetic word about you. Let me lay hands on you. Let me tell you what God told me. to. Do. I don't believe that person. They're a liar. Amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. So I would just rather believe what's written here rather than trusting anything else in this world. So the Bible is not only the book of life, it is the book of your life and every question that you can possibly conceive of to question the answer is right here in this book it is the book of your life and so we go to the Bible with that approach how is it that we understand 
um, what not only what happened in the past, how, not only what ha is happening right now, how is it that we can understand what's going on with North Korea right now? You've been watching that? Those people scare me. Those people are, they should be, uh, North Korea and Iran should be very scary to us. Okay? How can we know? Uh, can, do you think, do you really think you can trust Tom Brokaw and the NBC Nightly News? Or CNN? No. No! Somebody's going, no! It's like, how stupid are you? You can't. But I can go here and find answers. Okay? I can go right here and find answers. Not only what happened in the past, not only what's happening now, what's going to happen in the future. There are people in this world who say, oh, let me read your palm. Let me read your palm. Hey, hey, would you like your, hey, would you like your palm read? You know that trick, don't you? Yeah. Missed that one. There are people who say, oh, let me read your palm and I'll tell you your future. Or let me, um, let me gaze at the stars and I'll tell you what's going to happen. I used to read when I was a kid. I used to read my horoscope. Don't act like you didn't. Good for you. But I used to read my, I used to come home from school, grab the daily paper in our county and open it up and read the horoscope and I'd go, wow, that happened to me today. What I didn't know was what that was for tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't know that. But all of those things are corruptions of a sure word of what? Prophecy. It'll tell you what is going to happen. I know what's going to happen. Amen? Amen? And even if you only know one prophecy in the Bible, stick with it. That is the prophecy of where you are going to spend eternity. I, ex I believe this Bible. I believe that it is a sure word of prophecy in that I believe that God tells me that I am going to heaven when I die. And I know this to be true because I read it in the sure word of prophecy. So we're going to uncover things that there are, there are two forces in this world. There is a force for evil. There is a force for good. And we're going to talk about the forces of evil tonight. That includes people, politicians, businessmen, preachers, and those who are leading them. They're called devils. Do you believe those things are real? The forces of good are God, Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit, the holy angels in heaven, and, and the Word of God, and those who follow the Word of God. That's who we're dealing with tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 18, um, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found any among you, or among you, any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination. That, it is, that is an attempt to discern the future without using the Bible. That's divination. Or an observer of times. That also is an attempt to discern the future without the Bible. Or an enchanter, or a witch. A witch is someone who tries to use or have power outside of the power of God. Okay? Or a charmer, or watch this, or a consulter with familiar spirits. What are familiar spirits? They're devils. They are devils. They are devils who, and I don't want to get, I don't want to spend a lot of time dealing with familiar spirits tonight, but do you believe that there are certain politicians who are being led by devils. Do you believe that? Amen. Okay. Do you believe that there are businessmen in this world who are being led by devils? In New York? In Hollyweird? In Nashville? Do you think there are record company executives that are being led by devils? Sure there are. Do you think that there are preachers? Yes. And I have several videos on that, okay? D um, politicians, business leaders. Hey, there might even be business leaders in this county, in this town, that, have con that are consultants with familiar spirits. They're being led. They're being inspired. Do you think music is being written that is being demonically inspired? 
See how, so when you believe in a conspiracy, it's easy to believe that there are devils who have a lot more power than mankind who are doing and coordinating all these things together to achieve a goal. And that goal is to enthrone Lucifer as the God of the universe and to remove God from his, from his position, from his throne. Their conspiracy also is Psalm chapter 2, turn there. I did a whole teaching on conspiracy theories right from the Bible. The Bible will tell you all the conspiracy theories that are going on. And here's one of them. Here's one aspect of it. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. That is a conspiracy. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. That is against God, His Son Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and you. There is a conspiracy to destroy this church. There is a conspiracy to destroy your family. And you know it. You know it. You know there is. There is a conspiracy to destroy Christianity in general. Okay? And here's what they say. Let us break their bands asunder. What's this, on my, what's this on my finger right here? It is a wedding band. So why are they trying to enforce gay marriage in every state in this country? Because it breaks the bands of the picture of Christ and the church. It breaks that band asunder. That's a conspiracy, isn't it? And I, listen, I read an article today, and I'm going to put it on our... We have, a, we have a weekly broadcast out of our church. It broadcasts over the internet, the Watchman broadcast. And I deal with current events. So here Tuesday, the Supreme Court of California upholds the will of the people. Thank God for that. It is we the people. Amen? The, and so the California Supreme Court upheld the will of the people. Nancy Pelosi, Congressman, Democratic Congressman from California from Sandy, San Francisco, if you can believe that, okay? She comes out and says, what a travesty that the Supreme Court upheld the will of the people. When it was her job, Mom, I'm preaching now, it was her job to, to be a representative of the will of the people. <sighs> That's a conspiracy. And who's... Who's really leading Nancy Pelosi? Isn't it easy to see that familiar spirits and devils let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us? Why? Because you and I are standing in the way. Okay? We're standing in the way. So everybody understands, because I'm going to show you some things tonight, that if you don't believe that the conspiracy is demonic then it won't make sense. You'll say, well, that's, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? What do I have behind me up here on the screen? What is that? Okay. It's, it's associated with the Freemasons. What does it mean? What does it mean? Does anybody know? Does anybody know what it means? So you drive down the road and you see this square and this compass. By, by the way, you, this lodge number, did you see the number up there? Can you see the number up there on the screen? Am I in somebody's way here? Okay, lodge number 666, this is in Hershey, what, oh now, is that better, okay, was I better off over there, was I okay, okay, all right, I'll stay here, lodge number 666, why the number, why the symbol, and if you ask them, they will not tell you the truth. They are sworn to secrecy. They are sworn by an oath that says that if they reveal it, they will have their throat slit from ear to ear. That's what they do in their lodges. That's what they say. Does that sound Christian to you? There's no way it can sound Christian to us. Okay? So anyway, we're going to talk about secrets tonight. The, the book, the, the book of Freemasonry, and there are several of them. One of them is called Morals and Dogmen. I have a copy of this book. It's about this thick, about 800 some odd pages long. 
And in the front of this book, and I was going to bring it with me tonight, and I left it at home. In the front of this book of Morals and Dogma, and the copy that I have says, Esoteric Book, to be given only to a Scottish Rite Freemason. Esoteric means secret. It means that nobody but a Scottish Rite Freemason has a right to read that book and know what's inside of it. Nobody does. Now, I contrast that with this book here. And I'm telling you that everybody has a right to know what's in this book. Amen? Amen. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to only those who are worthy or deserve it. Is that what Jesus said? He said, to every living creature. Let everybody know. Jesus said, what I, what I whisper in your, ear, in, in your ear, you proclaim from the rooftops. You tell everybody what I told you. Is there anything in your church doctrine or belief system or practice that when you go to knock on somebody's door, you cannot immediately tell them if they ask? Anything. Is there any secret thing that you guys do here that you don't want outsiders to know about? No. 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 That if you are, then you're a cult. And the word occult means secret, hidden. So in this book, Morals and Dogma, which by the way, I read most of this book, okay? And I was looking for their secret. In 800 some odd pages, he alluded to it, but he never wrote it down and it made me mad. But anyway, Albert Pike, he called it the Grand Arcanum. He said, that secret whose revelation would overturn earth and heaven. Let no one expect us to give them its explanation. He who passes behind the veil that hides this mystery understands that it is in its very nature inexplicable or unexplainable and that it is death to those who win it by surprise as well to him who reveals it. Bring it on because I'm going to reveal it tonight. If you don't know it already, I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you every I'm going to tell you the secret that's behind Freemasonry, the New Age movement, the Rosicrucians, movies that you've seen, TV products that you I'm going to tell you the greatest secret that has ever been on the face of the earth. He also said the truth must be kept secret. Now is that what the Bible says? And the masses need a teaching proportioned to their imperfect reason. You know what he's saying? You are the masses because you're not a mason. And you can never, ever, ever, ever know the truth because you're not a mason. So when we tell you something as masons, we're lying. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, keep that word in mind. There's a woman in the Bible who has that name. All the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead, that means lie, those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them. Now what did Jesus tell us to do if we had a candle? Did he tell us to conceal it? Amen? You remember the song? Let it sight shine till Jesus comes. All right? From them and to draw them away from it. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or would pervert it. He goes on to say, So masonry jealously conceals its secrets and intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. So basically they're saying that if you, if you, if you heard from a mason what a symbol means, they lied. They were not telling you the truth. Manley Hall, an occult Masonic writer, he wrote a book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. I read most of this book looking for the secret. He didn't write it down either. He said, the book to which this is the introduction is dedicated to the proposition that concealed within the emblematic figures, allegories, and rituals of the ancients is a secret doctrine concerning the inner mysteries of life, which doctrine has been preserved in toto or in completeness among a small band of initiated minds since the beginning of the world. Departing, these illumined philosophers left their formula that others, too, might attain to understanding. 
But, lest these secret processes fall into uncultured hands and be perverted, the great arcanum, which means great secret, was always concealed in symbol or allegory. So we go back to that square and compass. That square and compass, that square and compass reveals the secret that they are concealing. And if you are of the highest order and level of these secret groups, then you know you are what I call the Illuminati. You've heard that word before, right? The movie that's out now by Dan Brown, Angels and Demons, is about a secret order called the Illuminati. They are real. They exist. They are the people who know what the secret is. They support it. And everything they're doing is to try to make sure that the secret takes place here on earth. That's who the Illuminati is. And that's who he's referring to. Now, look at, let's go to the Bible for a minute. I, I added these verses this afternoon. I really felt like the Lord wanted me to. So I want you to pay attention here. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee how? Now let me ask you a question. You ever, have you ever invited somebody to church? You ever invited somebody to church? Did you go, hey, I want you to come to church next Sunday. <laughs> Never did that? Hey, I'd like to invite you to church, Sonny. Would you like to come? Yes. Okay. And usually say, no. <laughs> Move on. Okay. But in secret societies, they're, they're, they're trying to entice you how? secretly. And he said, if they entice thee secretly, saying, let us go and serve what? Other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him. Masons have a logo that says, to be one, ask one. So if you ask a Mason to be a Mason, they will bring you in. And if they invite you in, say, no, I can't. It's a secret society. And God said, I can't do that. It's written in the law. God said, I couldn't do it. Mm -mm -mm. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be the first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And this law is not concerning your next door neighbor. It's your own family members. If you go look at it. For 2 Kings chapter 17, And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. Now do you know, do you know what I know? about every person sitting in this room tonight is that you do things secretly against the Lord your God. Everybody does. Everybody sitting in this, and see, you didn't amen that. Because when you, when you either disagree with me or you're, you're going, I'm not going to talk. I'm not saying a word. I don't know what it is. But you do. None of us who go to church ever make it a point to sin openly. We all have those little secret sins against the Lord our God. And they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchman to the fence city. Job 13.10 He will surely reprove you if you do secretly accept persons. You know, what I, you know what I saw with my own eyes one morning? I was in with somebody I know who, was, who had to go to court. And this was like an arraignment procedure and all this and that and the other. With my own eyes. And this is in our county courthouse. You've heard of the good old boys network, right? It's real. Because all of the lawyers who were in that county, they were talking to the judge and this and that and the other. They know each other. In comes a city boy. Okay? I could tell he was city because his hair was slicked differently than the other boys that was there. Young lawyer walked in. Did not know the judge. Had never been to that county before. He walks in with his square and compass lapel pin on his jacket. What that means is 
we're going to work out a deal for my client. And that, in the scripture, is called secretly accepting persons. And you're never to do that. God told us to judge according to the book, not according to our affiliations, our families, or our feelings. Amen? Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking where? Who's the lion? It's Satan. Where is he, where is he right now? He's waiting for you in a secret place. He's waiting for you in the place, watch this, where your secret sins are. And he'll devour you if he gets the chance. How many of you believe that? Say amen. amen. Now, remember the mystery. There's a woman in the Bible whose name is Mystery. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Proverbs 5, chapter 6 speaks of this strange woman and says, Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Two spirits operate in this world, a spirit of harlots and a spirit of God. One is a holy spirit, one is an unholy spirit. One works in the light, in the open. One is the light. The only light allowed inside the tabernacle, the temple. Remember what the temple is? The only light allowed was the seven candlesticks inside of there. That was the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit of God. He is the light. Her spirit always works in darkness and in secret places and in secret symbols and in secret things. you believe that? Say amen. amen. Here is a description of her. Proverbs chapter 7. Behold, Solomon was looking out his window at night. And he said, Beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. You see, men who are sinners, do they love daylight or nighttime? What, what, how, those of you who've ever been in a bar, what's it look like to you? There are no well-lit taverns. Amen? And most sins take place when? Daytime, nighttime. You see how it works. Because our, dark, our sins are evil and they're dark and our deeds are dark and we don't like to be seen doing them. Yet Christianity is lying. Are you getting the contrast here? Okay, I'm just kind of laying a laying the groundwork here. Now, I went to, there is a building in Washington, D.C. It is called the, um, oh, I forgot what it's called. It's the Mother Lodge of America. It's in Washington, D.C. It's about 13 blocks north of the White House. I went into this lodge. They, they, they take you to, on a tour through the, through the lodge, okay? They have a library of about 7,000 volumes in this lodge. And I knew that they had a library in there. And I'm going, man, I bet they only let like high-ranking masons into that library. You know what I found out? I found out that I could walk in there any time that they're open and read any book I wanted to. Do you know why? Because they know that the secret that they possess is not written down in any of them. They know that you will never, ever, ever figure it out from reading those books. And so I did. I read Masonic literature. I read this and I read that. There is one place where their secret is written. And you're looking at it. Here's a Masonic book from 1866 called The Masonic Ladder. Remember what we said about DNA last night? What does DNA look like? Think about it. The Masonic Ladder, written in 1866, said the Bible is full of Masonic secrets to the initiated. They're saying that the Bible has the secret in it. Here's a book called Freemasonry in the Holy Land. This was written in the 1800s. The author said that the Holy Scriptures are the instruction books of the Lodge. So the secret is in the Bible. Albert Pike said, For the master, the compass of faith is above the square of reason, but both rest upon the holy scriptures and combine to form the blazing star of truth. So even Albert Pike said that the Bible is where the secret is. Here's a book called The Ignorant Learned, written in 1863. 
This author said the great, the great Masonic truths concealed among the learned of former ages under allegories and fables are therefore lost, long, long lost. But what is lost is not consequently destroyed. What is lost may be found, and all that is required is some clue or what? Key. key. And guess who? See, that's a Bible word, isn't it? The word key. Will you find the word key in the Bible? And guess who just happens to be holding the key? Jesus Christ does. He holds the keys, doesn't he? Okay? Now, fortunately, there are applicable keys held sacred by a body of men who know not their use. And the locks these keys fit are held sacred by all modern clergy and the multitude of religionists. The first and best evidence of the truthfulness of the keys is their being used to interpret the Bible, that heavenly book of truth. So I went into the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Washington, D.C., and if you ever go into a lodge or are familiar with the practices of the lodge, you know that right dead center of the lodge room itself, where the Masons have their meeting, is an altar. And on top of that altar is a King James Bible sitting right on top of there. Now, generally, that, that Bible is open often, and it has a square, and co square and compass sitting on top of it. There are a lot of reasons for that. Some of that I will talk about to tomorrow night. I will tell you why the square and compass is sitting on the Bible. But the truth of it is, is that God said to me, would you like to know the secret? And I said, God, yeah, I've been asking you. And I remember telling Jeremy Howe, some of you know him. I said, Jeremy, I said, I don't know, but I said, but I think God's trying to tell me that the secret that I'm looking for, and I didn't know what it was, the secret I'm looking for is going to be in the Bible. And he said, Brother Mike, I think you're right. And he began to pray for me, and I began to pray. And God said, you want to know where the secret is? And I said, yeah. And God said, we're going to study the Bible, and I'm going to show it to you. And I'm going to, show you, I'm going to give you one word out of the Bible, okay? And how we're going to find the secret. Jesus said, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Now that I know the secret, I cannot keep quiet about it. I have to tell people what it is. Now, do you remember last night when we looked at Jacob and Boaz? They were 23 cubits tall, so they represented what? The 23 chromosome pairs that are in our cells. And the chromosomes are where what is stored? Our DNA. The DNA. The book. Right? The book, of God, the, the, the book that God wrote is in our tw 23 chromosome pairs, epitomized in the temple as the, as the columns that Solomon built called Jachin and Boaz. So I'm going to show you a Masonic graphic up here. See the two columns and the letters J and B? That does not stand for Jim Beam. <laughs> what does it stand for? Jacob and Boaz. So think about it. Why do Masons use these two columns to conceal their secret? Now that you and I know what the columns are and what they represent, do you think now that we know a little bit about what their secret is? How many of you think you're getting it so far? Their secret has something to do with deoxyribonucleic acid, or the book that God wrote that's in our temple. That's what their secret has to do with. See this? This is called the Parthenon. This is in Athens, I believe, in Greece. This was, in its day, the greatest center of pagan worship in the world. The Parthenon is, is basically a temple where the gods live. Now think about what I just said. What is the temple? This is a temple where the gods live. Are you getting it? See those columns around that Parthenon? You want to take a guess how many of them there are? There's 46 of them. Exactly. This secret has been around for a long time, Mike. It's been around for a long time. Now, we only know scientifically that the human body in our cells that we had 46 chromosomes, we've only known that for a hundred some odd years. But the devil knew it a long time ago, didn't he? And he, remember, these guys are the ones that are controlling the secret. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. I want you to listen to this verse very carefully. That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. You believe in that? Say amen. amen. And that man of sin, who is that? It's the Antichrist. 
that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is, is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth where? In the temple of God. What is the temple of God? The only proper interpretation of this verse is the human body. Because God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, does He? The only way God would ever enter this room is if He walked in with you. Amen. Well, it's deep, isn't it? So the man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to reign as God where? Right inside the hearts of human beings in this earth. That is the ultimate form of demon possession. They've taken over mankind. Showing himself that he is God. Remember that. What is that? DNA. Okay? And we've only known, we've only known of this general structure of DNA since the 1950s. Okay? But I'm going to show you something that goes back about 4,000 years. Take a look at it. What does that look like to you? Dennis, what does that look like to you? Looks like DNA, doesn't it? Entwined snakes. Looks just like DNA, doesn't it? Remember, this conspiracy is not just men. It's devils. It's the devil, who Ezekiel said is wiser than Daniel. This goes back to ancient Samaria. Does that look like DNA to you? How about this one? A Peruvian textile from 300 years before Christ. Wow. Secret's been around a long time, hasn't it? You've seen the caduceus? In his, what is that, his right hand? It's DNA. It's been around thousands of years. The devils knew the secret. This showed up on Time magazine. Solving the mysteries, the mysteries of DNA. And there, depicted on the cover, is Adam and Eve. And what is that behind them? It's a tree. Think about it. Are we getting close? Okay. See that? That is a New Age Eastern mysticism idea called Kundalini. Kundalini says that at the base of your spine is a coiled serpent. And if you go through the proper in, uh, initiations and rituals, like emptying your mind, channeling familiar spirits, or receiving an, an initiation pat on the forehead from a guru, <coughs> think about that one. Then you will receive kundalini. The serpent will then begin to crawl up your backbone. Now remember what we learned last night about the backbone. How many bones? 33. Why do masons use that number? Think about it. It's a number for them for illumination. When the serpent winds his way up your spine and enters your forehead, you receive enlightenment. And you are one with the universe. You're one with everything. How many of you remember a rock group called Sticks? How many of you know what the name Sticks is? <laughs> a rock group. Who said that? Get out. You're not one with anything. <laughs> okay. The river Styx is the river that flows through hell in Greek mythology. And this, the rock group Styx had a song called The Serpent Rising. And the lyrics are, for, In the abyss of space from the center of time, a superman race. Think about it. Moves the serpent to climb. The secret revealed 
when ye leave your cave is a glory of thunder and life from the grave. The serpent is rising and coiling in your spine, bringing you light from the depths of your mind. Who inspired the song? Familiar spirits. Okay? Now, I was in Michigan. I drove past this billboard. I said, stop! I got to take a picture of this. The Michigan Masons, in trying to recruit people, their slogan was, share the secret. So I'm going to. <laughs> they said I could. So I'm going to tell you what the secret of Freemasonry, the New Age, I call it New Age because it rhymes with sewage, <laughs> the New Age movement, and everything that the devil does not want out, I'm going to tell you what it is. Okay? Down here at the bottom, next to their square and compass, which tells you the secret, says, Masons, live better. Now, masonry is all about the ascension of mankind. Remember last night when I told you about evolution and that evolution is dangerous? Masonry supports evolution because masonry says that mankind and the New Age movement says that mankind is about ready to enter his next stage of evolution where mankind will be more than human. We will be transhuman. We will be super men. We will be a divine race. We will be as gods. Thank you. So the slogan, live better, you, do you understand that? Now, if you work at Walmart or go to Walmart, you're not going to hell. Okay? We live in this world, but we are not of this world. Can I hear you say amen? Now, <laughs> masonry is all about rebuilding Solomon's temple. Now remember, the Bible says that the temple is what? The body. So masonry then secretly is about rebuilding the human being. Okay? So, there in the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Washington, D.C., they have a slogan on the inside that says, Masonry builds its temples where? They're telling you the secret. Okay? Now, has anybody ever seen this symbol before? This is on the Masonic Temple in McAllister, Oklahoma. A pastor took me there and he said, Pastor Mike, you've got to see this stuff. It's a cross with a rose on it. Okay? It is called the Rosicrucian concept or the Rosicrucian doctrine. The Rosicrucians was a secret society that sort of arose in Europe just prior to the time that masonry was really taking root, and masonry adopted Rosicrucian thought into its, into its teachings. So masonry and Rosicrucianism are linked together. Here is what Rosicrucian doctrine says. It says, the manner and the means by which the present day man is what? Transformed into the divine superman. Remember what we just saw that song from Styx? The Superman race, the divine race. This symbol, Christian Rose Cross, shows the end and aim of what? And you thought it was just that we came from monkeys. Evolution is not about where we came from, but where they say we're going. That's why it's dangerous. Human evolution, the solution of the world mystery, man's past evolution present constitution, and particularly the secret of his future development. What is man going to be turned into? We're going to find out. Pike said, it is for each individual Mason to discover the secret of Masonry by reflection upon its symbols and a wise consideration and analysis of what is said and done in the work. Masonry does not inculcate her truths. She states them once and briefly or hints them, perhaps darkly, or interposes a cloud between them and eyes that would be dazzled by them. Seek and ye shall find knowledge and truth. So that's what we're going to do. Albert Pike associates this great secret with the discovery of the alchemist's philosopher's stone.
The Philosopher's Stone is the concept in alchemy and Rosicrucianism that basically is the key, listen to this, to immortality. Man can live forever if he discovers the Philosopher's Stone. The very first Harry Potter book that was written was called Harry Potter and the, Al or the Philosopher's Stone. In America, it was called the Sorcerer's Stone. So millions of teenage boys and girls know more about the secret than you do. And our public school said, oh, these kids got to read this book. We're just glad that they're reading something. Well, what if they were reading Playboy? Amen? Amen. It's the same garbage. Now, God said, Mike, you want to know the secret? Yeah, well, yeah, I want to know the secret. God said, we're going to study a word in the Bible. I like to study words in the Bible because I think the Bible has words. And they mean something, right? God knows how to talk, and God knows how to talk in English. Amen? Mm. So I said, God, what word? And he said, secret. Let's study the word secret. And I'm going, cool. That makes sense, doesn't it? You want to know what the secret is? Let's look at the word secret. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are what? Revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made where? David said, when I was made in secret. And what did we discover about that last night? The secret of the womb is where David was made. So the secret has something to do with how David was made. And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. For the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. For God shall bring every work into judgment with what? Every secret thing. God said, God is the revealer of secrets, isn't he? Let's get back to this secret sin thing. Because God says, I'm going to reveal them to you, just me and you personally. How many of you know that to be true? Say amen. The Holy Spirit of God shows up, knocks on your door, and says, we need to talk. That's one witness. Remember what Jesus said? If thy brother sin, go to him. So the Holy Ghost shows up. And says, we need to talk. I saw what you did. And I'm revealing it to you first. You see, God follows his own pattern. Thank God. Amen? Because there are things about us we don't want anybody else to know. Come on. Don't make me feel bad. Raise your hand. Oh, really, Brother Mike? No, the Holy Ghost came. And said, Mike, I'm going to deal with some things that nobody knows about, but I'm going to deal with them. Thank you, God. But see, if you reject that, then God's going to send a preacher to your house. Or, or that preacher's going to hammer your hide to the wall on Sunday morning, and you're going to think, he knows. <laughs> see, that's God working in a church. You ought, you ought to thank God for a pastor that God will do that with. But if that doesn't work... You just mark my word. God's going to expose you for who you are to a lot of people. Because God reveals the secret things. With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my what? A secret place can be polluted. And who's going to go into it? Robbers. Who's the thief? Satan. He's a thief and a robber, isn't he? And he's going to go into the secret place and defile it. In the Old Testament, what was the only place secret from the Israelites? Only one man knew what it was and what was in there. What was it? It was the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. Are you with me? And remember what that is. That's the cell nucleus where the DNA is stored. Get it? There it is, right there. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it where? 
in a secret place. What did we just say was the secret place? It was the most holy place, the cell nucleus. Do not put an idol in your secret place. And the people shall answer and say, Amen. that they would desire, now here it is, the book of Daniel, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. That Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. And when I got to this point, I'm going, Daniel knew the secret. Daniel knew the secret. And, Deut and Daniel chapter 2 is the story of Nebuchadnezzar's image. Remember? The head of gold, the chest of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs and the feet of iron, but the toes, iron, mingled with clay. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time going into a lot of detail about Bible numerics and so on, but it means a lot. The fourth kingdom is where we're going to concentrate on. The iron mixed with miry clay. Think of something in the Bible that's made out of clay. You. Aren't you? Okay? Okay? We're made out of clay. The clay represents man. This fourth kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. This number four always points you to, watch this, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where Paul said our real wrestling takes place. Amen? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the four powers, those, that fourth kingdom. The fourth beast that Daniel sees is diverse from the other three. He is not of this world. He is from the spirit realm. I don't have time to go into that tonight. Study this. I have a video coming out just on the number four, and I explain it in detail. When I have it out, I, I want you to get a copy of it so you'll know. But this fourth kingdom is all about a spiritual kingdom that dominates planet Earth. Is there not a spiritual kingdom that's trying to dominate your life? Is there a spiritual kingdom that's trying to dominate your home? A spiritual kingdom trying to dominate your church? Is the one trying to take control of the country? Then why not take control of the entire earth? You believe it? Say amen. That's what the number four leads you to. That's what this fourth kingdom is all about. And what does it say about this kingdom? That they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 verse 43. He's explaining the fourth kingdom and why the toes are part iron and part clay. He said, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with what? And the seed of men is what? your DNA. Right? The seed of men is your DNA. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now I'm going to show you in every Masonic cell. I can read symbols now like they're an open book because I know the secret. Once, once I knew the secret, you can't hide a symbol from me. I'll tell you what it is. And I'm going to tell you what this is. Albert Pike, watch this. Now, this fourth kingdom is, this, is the supernatural realm. Okay? And it's this, this satanic, demonic realm. That's the fourth kingdom. So think about this. Albert Pike said that this symbol here, the compass, represents the heavenlies, the heavenly realm. This symbol here represents the earthly realm. And notice that they are fused together. They're, they're not separated. They are joined together. Does everybody see that so far? This is they, and this is the seed of men. This is the heavenly and the earthly. The male, the female. Get it? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. There is a story you can believe it or not. It says, Genesis chapter 6, that the sons of God came and took the daughters of men to be wise. Watch this. The sons of God 
mingled with the daughters of men. Makes sense, doesn't it? We're going to show you some more. Albert Pike said, The square, therefore, is a natural and appropriate symbol of this earth. The compass is an equally natural and appropriate symbol of the heavens. The compass is the hermetic symbol of the creative deity, male, and the square of the productive earth or universe. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Heaven mingled with earth. Have you ever heard that before? Let's, let's move on. Now, heaven, all of the ancient pagans worshipped the sun god, didn't they? The Indians did, the Mayans did, the Greeks did, the Romans did, the Babylonians did, the Sumerians did, the Egyptians did. Everybody worshipped the sun god for some reason. But it's not the god of the universe, isn't it? So if it's not the god that you and I know, it's a false god, it's a devil, isn't it? And the sun is where? The sun is not on earth, is it? It's in heaven. They also worshipped a mother goddess of the earth. She is called Gaia, Isis, Ashtaroth, Ishtar, Easter, Diana, Venus, Mother Nature. And she is worshipped as a goddess because she is productive, she is fruitful. So watch this. I want you to think about this. What happens when the sun meets with the productive earth? It produces green things. Get it? Doesn't it? How do trees grow? How does grass grow? The sun meets the earth. And, that's, and the trees and the grass of the earth are the children of the union of the sun and the earth. You, do you understand that? Now, see this image here? It's hanging from a tree. And somebody's about ready to take it. Think of a story in the Bible. Forty-six words that the devil spoke to Eve. Who? That he spoke to Eve, trying to get her to partake of the child that was produced by the union of the sun and the earth. This is deep stuff. Are you getting it? Okay. You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under what? They worshipped the trees, didn't they? They worshipped under the trees. They worshipped where? In the groves. What were groves? There was little gardens that they planted and they put an image of a mother holding a little baby. Have you ever seen that one before? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? That which was is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. And God said to the Israelites, if you see one of those, destroy it. I dare you. <laughs> okay? But he said, that's an abomination in the earth. Yet within three days, now watch this. Fruit hangs from a tree, doesn't it? I want you to think of things in the Bible that hang from a tree. Pharaoh shall lift up thy head from off thee, and thou shalt hang on a tree. Deuteronomy 21, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. He that is hanged is accursed of God. That's why God did not want them to eat it. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the ending of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. What does that sound like to you? Jesus hung on a tree. And they took him down at even. And they put him in a great pit and they rolled a great stone. But that stone was rolled away. Amen? See, Jesus conquered his enemies that are cursed by taking on the curse for us. Somebody say amen. amen. Whoa, I like it. I dig it. Masons 
When you join their lodge, the very first thing that they have you do in the first initiation is put a rope around your neck. It's called a cable toe, and it has three strands, and I'll show you why tomorrow night. What are they acting out in the Masonic Lodge? The cursed one who hung from a tree, not Jesus, the Antichrist. Sons of God, daughters of men, the heaven principle, the earth principle, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they bear children to them. That is, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That happened in Genesis chapter 6. You can believe that or not. That's exactly what happened. Seed equals what? Genetics. And so here's what God said in Genesis 3. The Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Who? The serpent and the woman. And between thy seed... Now who is her seed? It's Christ. And us. But it's Christ, right? Literally? Was Christ born of a woman? Literally. Then why is it this literal? It is. The seed of the serpent is always rec uh, recognized in the Bible by called, being called children of Belial. Here it is. Certain men, children of Belial, sons of Belial, children of Belial, sons of Belial, the sons of Belial as thorns. What was the ground cursed with? What did Jesus wear on his head? What was Paul, a messenger of Satan? An angel of Satan to buffet him. What was it? It's the son of Belial. Children of Belial, you are of your father, the devil. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, thou child of the devil. Is this just simply metaphorical language meant to draw us into imaginations? No. God is telling you that this, there's a war going on between the seed of the woman the seed of the serpent. You believe it or not. You ever seen this symbol before? In its simplest form, it's called the Star of David. David doesn't have a star. You will not find the Star of David mentioned anywhere in the Scriptures. Will you? And by the way, did God ever tell us to draw out symbols of Him? Images. He said stay away from them, didn't He? So I think we ought to. So let me show you what this means. This is pointing up like the square and the compass. Sons of, notice the opposites here. White, dark. White, dark. Up, down. Sons of God, daughters of men. This is the secret. They are mingling themselves with the seed of men. See this serpent around this with his tail in his mouth? See that? That's called the Ouroboros. Guess what it means? This is, they call it a secret of immortality. The symbol of immortality. The symbol of eternal life. Now that doesn't look like salvation to me, does it? By the way, that's a dragon. A serpent. The devil does not have the key to immortality, although he tried to tell Eve that he had it. Ye shall not surely die. He tried to tell her that she would live forever if she listened to him. And not her husband, whose name was Adam, who was a picture of Jesus Christ. Get it? So guess what this means? Albert Pike says, The mouth of the dragon represents the woman. Open. The tail represents the male. This is the earth. This is the heavenly. Sons of God mingle with the daughters of men. How many of you see that? Wow. This symbol is described as, is, has a strong relation to what is known as the androgyny. You know what androgyny is? It's a combination of male and female in one body. Sons of God, daughters of men. The androgyny is united male and female principles together. This is the prime primordial end to the human endeavor. Did you get that? This is where they say mankind is headed in his next phase of evolution. He is headed toward the day where he is 
sons of God mingled with daughters of men. The fusion of the opposites, the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. The reunion, the reunion which births totality and creation. It is not unlike the idea of androgyny, which is a duality complete, a return to wholeness. Here it is again. Sons of God, daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. Look at that. We're going to find out what that means in a little bit. Have you ever seen the yin-yang symbol? Okay. The yin-yang symbol is this Chinese symbol, and we're going to see it again in a little bit, is the Chinese concept of, e of um, balance. Have you ever heard somebody in karate saying, you need to find balance? Right? You saw Karate Kid? <laughs> He's being taught a pagan, new age, from hell concept of balance. That concept of balance refers to, in, in their simplistic form, they say there's a little good in all evil and a little evil in all good. Now, is that correct according to the Bible? The Bible says, what fellowship hath light with darkness? None. So this concept is the sons of God mingled with the daughters of men united together. That's what this is. This image here, remember these two pillars, what are they? Jacob and Boaz. I'm telling you all the Masonic symbols. The 23 chromosome pairs. Jacob and Boaz. See this twining around here? What is that? DNA. DNA. We have uh, these four elements here, which I didn't cover tonight, but I do cover in another video. They represent the four chambers of the heart, or they represent the throne of God. Because here you have a man, a lion, uh, an ox, and an eagle. Those are the four cherubims that supported the throne of God in Ezekiel chapter 1. And who wants to sit on the throne of God? Satan does. Here's the square and compass. Sons of God, daughters of men. Here we have the keystone of Freemasonry. Now what did we say last night that DNA was? It's a crystal, so therefore it's a stone. The keystone of Freemasonry is what unites this side with this side. We have opposites here. We have the sun and the moon. They are opposites. Night and day. Drawn together by the keystone. It's DNA. That's what that means. The checkerboard floor. Dark and light intermixed together. Sons of God, daughters of men. I could go on this all night. Daniel said, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with iron clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. You seen that symbol before? Carpenters Union. Sons of God, daughters of men. I even found this in the Bible. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He maketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with the planes and he marketh it out with the compass. And maketh it after the figure of a man. What's this carpenter doing? He's making an idol. Do you, how many of you believe the Bible reveals all the secrets? Raise your hand. Amen. Washington, D.C. This image here is called an obelisk. It is a symbol of the male. The God, Osiris, Satan. On top of the Capitol building here is a statue of a goddess. How many of you knew that? No wonder the capital's all messed up. If I were president, I'd get rid of that thing. I'd make a lot of people mad and be assassinated. But I would get rid of it. So watch this. The street layout of Washington, D.C. forms a square and compass. This point here points you to the male. This point here points you to the female. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. See the two heads here? Albert Pike says one face is one way and one face is another way because th this represents the heavenly principle, the male. This represents the earthly principle, the female, and they're joined together in one body. Sons of God mingled with daughters of men. And what is this called? A brotherhood. I'm not saying if you belong to a union, you're going to hell. Okay? It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying 
is that there are a lot of secrets in trade unions. How many of you believe that? Say amen. amen. Secret deals. Baphomet. The image of, of the God of the Knights Templar and Freemasons. He has female and male parts. One hand points up, one hand points down. He is the androgyny. He is the sons of God mingled with the daughters of men in one body. And who is this? It's Lucifer himself, isn't it? We're going to talk more about these arms a little bit later on. On his arms he has salve and coagula. This is the process of alchemy. Alchemy was the ancient secret concept of trying to turn lead into gold. But you can't turn lead into gold, can you? Can't do it. So it didn't really mean lead into gold. It meant turning humans into immortals, gods. That's what alchemy was about. And the process is you have to dissolve the old man first so you can coagulate into a new creature. That's what that means. That's a statue of George Washington in Washington, D.C. What does it look like? You think there's a conspiracy in our nation's capital? Remember what DNA looked like? So if I show you Masonic symbols that look like ladders and they reach from earth into heaven, what are you looking at? DNA. Mingling heaven or joining heaven with the earth. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. How many of you understand this so far? You're seeing it now in all the symbols. There it is here, and even here in this Masonic symbol, they put angels ascending and descending on it. They're telling you it comes right out of the Bible. What does the Tower of Babel look like? And what were they trying to do with it? Wow. And so I counted, I counted from my King James Bible. I've, it's, listen, that Bible has never, I've, I've never been able to prove it wrong yet. Rule number one, there are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if you think you found one, refer to rule number one. <laughs> because you are not smarter than God who gave us a gift by way of His Holy Spirit. And that gift was the ability to translate unknown tongues. And He said, if a man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two and at the most three. You know how many original languages there were in the Bible? Three. Hebrew, Greek, and a little bit of Aramaic. And then He said, let one translate. And it's a gift, isn't it? I believe God knows how to translate Bibles. It's never failed. So I went to Genesis 11, Dennis, and I counted the exact number of words that were spoken by man as they build the tower. 46 of them. It's never been wrong yet. Does anybody know what May Day is? What a Maypole is? A maypole represents the male. And the girls dance around it as they take their ribbons and twine it around the maypole. It's a fertility dance. That's who the May Queens are. How many of you remember a song from Led Zeppelin called Stairway to Where? And does, do they mention the May Queen in there? And do you think Led Zeppelin was being inspired by the Holy Spirit? No. They, one of the guys, I think it was Jimmy Page, moved into Aleister Crowley's mansion and he wrote Stairway to Heaven while under I, I, a trance. And she is buying your stairway to heaven. This is Rosalind Chapel. I talk about that in, a, in the Da Vinci Code video that I have. Rosalind Chapel was, Chapel was built by the Knights Templar. They put Freemason symbols all in it.
and they built a, a pillar called the Apprentice Pillar. What does it look like? And, and Rosalind Chapel is supposed to be a rebuilding of Solomon's Temple. What is Solomon's Temple? And the pillar reaches from the ground to the ceiling, from the earth to the heaven. That's the secret. If you read the Da Vinci Code to see the movie, then you know the secret. Masonry talks about a winding staircase in the temple. And that when you reach the top, you reach the enlightenment of Freemasonry. Oh look, here's Jacob and Boaz. And here is a globe of the earth and a globe of the stars. What are stars? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Do you believe it now? Huh? You believe the secret from the Bible? I went to the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. And the tour guide takes me and I see a, a winding staircase. And I'm going, I know what that is. I didn't tell the tour guide, Dad. But I know what it is. And it, there's two of them. One goes this way and one goes that way. And they wind around to the sanctuary of the, of the temple. And so, dummy me, I'm going up the steps and guess what I'm doing? 23 steps on this side, 23 steps on the other side. I'm not making this up. It's the secret, isn't it? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Statue of Liberty was given as a gift from French Freemasons to the American Freemasons. Guess what it has inside of it? Winding staircase. Dun, dun, dun. And this is, not, this is not liberty. This is a goddess. It's a statue. It's something God told us not to have. Do we not believe the Bible? Amen? Amen. And she holds the light of occult illumination in her hand. I saw this at the mall the other day. Rock music. How many of you believe that's inspired by the devil? Amen? And a stairway of DNA going from earth into heaven. Which you ought not be listening to. Bless God, I ain't listening to that junk. Me and Conway Twitty, I don't go for that stuff. <laughs> In China, this secret's everywhere. Chinese always had a concept that at one point, listen to this, at one point the gods came down to the earth. And that the kings, the emperors of China, were all called the sun gods because the emperors of China believed that they were the offspring of the gods who mated with their women. And they have a temple in China called Heaven on Earth Temple. Because they believe that is the place where the gods ascended, where the sons of God came and married the daughters of men. You see, every culture in the world has a story that says that gods came down and mated with women and created the titans, the giants, and something else. And I'll share it with you later. Have you ever seen this symbol before? The cross and the crown. It's not Christian. You don't need symbols. You got a Bible full of them. Amen? The male, the female. Sons of God mingle with the daughters of men. It's outside of a church in my town. You know what that's saying? If you're a Mason, you're welcome here. They know what it means. I didn't know it for years until I went, oh, I know what that means. I did one of those, John. Oh, I know what that means. Out in front of the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry, there are two sphinxes. Albert Pike says they represent Jachin and Boaz. What is Jachin and Boaz? The 23 chromosome pairs in the human cell where the DNA is stored. And what is a sphinx? It's the mixture of a man with a beast. What is the devil? He's a dragon. He's a serpent. He's a beast, isn't he? Think about it. What are the cherubs? They're heavenly beasts. John said, I saw the four what? Not the four humans. I saw the four beasts in heaven. Lucifer is a beast. A lot of those cherubims, they are beasts. They are angelic Beast and the sphinxes represent the cross between humans and those angels. 
You see the Da Vinci Code? See this symbol and this symbol. What does that represent? And what does that represent? The union of the male and the female, the sons of God with the daughters of men. Leonardo da Vinci knew this. He knew the secret or was part of the secret society. Some say it's the Priory of Zion. Some say that, that that didn't exist. But I'm telling you, da Vinci knew it. Because in his painting of the Last Supper, this is clearly Jesus and this is clearly a woman. Supposed to be Mary Magdalene. But here's what it really represents. The sons of God, and he's mingled with her, the daughters of men. Wow. Da Vinci himself, this is his character, uh, character of John the Baptist. This is the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is the androgyny. She has female parts and a male face. This is Da Vinci's face. And so is this, because Da Vinci was queer. He was an androgyny. He was a male and female combined in one body. And so before he drew John the Baptist, he drew a sketch in his book called Angel in the Flesh. And it was, a, I'm not showing you the rest of it, but Angel in the Flesh had male and female parts on his body. You get it, don't you? Angel in the Flesh, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. How many of you are convinced that that's the secret? This is in a stained glass in Scotland. Jesus and a pregnant Mary Magdalene. But that's not who that is, is it? Sons of God, the daughters of men, and their offspring. A combination of the two. Here's Mary Magdalene pregnant. She's holding a skull. Why is she holding a skull? Because the skull is her husband. And guess who the skull is? It's the Antichrist. The Antichrist, watch this, the Antichrist has a deadly head wound, right? What did Goliath get? Deadly head wound. What did, I can't remember in the book of Judges, who was it that drove the nail through that guy's skull? Pierced his skull, giving him a deadly head wound. Who was it that gave the devil a deadly wound in his head? At the place of the... Was Jesus. Isn't that cool? That's her husband. The Antichrist. The devil. And I'll, I'll show you something neat about this in a minute, alright? The list of the members of the Priory of Zion. From our video on the Da Vinci Code, from the Da Vinci Code movie and the book, and all this stuff. We have Blanche Devereaux, I've talked about her, Nicholas Flamel, Leonardo Da Vinci, Robert Flood, Isaac Newton, uh, Victor Hugo, who wrote uh, Beauty and the Beast, Claude Debussy, a composer, and a man by the name of Jean Cocteau. He was a French artist and film director. Jean Cocteau named himself, at, be, being on the list of the grandmasters of the Priory of Zion, the men who knew the secret, named himself Jean the 23rd, or John the 23rd. John Cocteau, John the 23rd, had a student training under him into the realms of the occult. This man later went on to become Pope John the 23rd. And why did he name himself the 23rd? 23 chromosome pairs, where the secret is. JFK. I don't know who killed him, but I think I know what it was about. It was a ceremony. Here you have the obelisk. The symbol of the male. Okay? Daily Plaza, this is where the grassy knoll was where a Masonic temple used to be. The grassy knoll forms, the street layout forms an obelisk. And this is where Kennedy was killed. In the movie JFK, this man is telling this man that he knows who did it. And he says, who is it that had the means to do it? Who is it that had the means to cover it up? Who? Who? And then they stop and they show you a picture of this. It represents the Masons. Guess how old John F. Kennedy was when he was killed? 46. What is that? Sons of God? Daughters of men. Remember the rose on the cross? The rose is a, is a symbol of secrecy. In the chapel, in um, Rosalind Chapel, the ceiling is covered with stone roses. Sub-rosa means anything done in secret. 
This was a secret meaning in this movie. Sub Rosa. Beauty, the beast. The beast, sons of God, mingling with the daughters of men. Alchemy symbols. Male and female, together in one body. Male and female, together. Sons of God, daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. Do you see any DNA here? These are alchemical. These are hundreds of years old. What are these? Everybody say cross. cross. Well, y'all are pretty smart. <laughs> these are symbols of the cross. Remember what we found out last night about the cross? What is it? It's our chromosomes where the DNA is stored. Okay? So when you see something that looks like a cross, and Albert Pike, this is the very first chapter of Morals and Dogma, in Albert Pike's book of Freemasonry. So what are we dealing with here? Now that you know the secret, you know what this is, don't you? It's an X chromosome where the DNA is stored. That's the secret. That's where the secret is. The Knights Templar had a secret. They are the progenitors of modern Freemasonry. Did you see National Treasure? I'm going to show you some more about that tomorrow night. But the Knights Templar discovered a secret, didn't they? And they always hid what the secret was. An X marks the spot. Now you know. I went into the Mother Lodge. That's what I found. It's in their temple. X marks the spot. Did you ever see that show? I talk about that in other videos. Okay? It's about an alien-human hybrid. That's what it's about. You ever seen this one? The X-Men. These are men who have had their DNA altered. So now they have superpowers. They are the supermen. They are the divine race. They are gods on the earth. And that's why they're called X-Men. See the two X's there? Does anybody know what a nexus is? It is the point at which two things converge and combine together. Isn't that something? Brand names. Okay? Who inspired this? Okay? What is that? Who did we say the skull was? Yeah. And what is this? The X chromosomes where the DNA is stored. You get it now? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what that means. Those are skull and crossbones. All brand. The keys of the papacy. They're the crossed keys, right? It's an X chromosome. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow night. All these crosses and Albert Pike's morals and dogma, he was talking about the cross being a symbol of the secret, the secret of Freemasonry. Here's one here. What does this look like to you? See all these swastikas? This is an ancient temple floor discovered. All these swastikas here. This goes back way before Adolf Hitler. It was a symbol of immortality. It represented the chromosomes of the human body. See the contrasting colors here. Dark and white. Dark and white. Sons of God, daughters of men. The chromosomes. Um, here we have the yin-yang symbols. Here. Sons of God, daughters of men. What do we see here? What is that? That is the barracks in the naval base in San Diego, California. Here's the New World Airport. Lies in New World Order. Denver, Colorado. Here, 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 here. They just built that thing in the 90s. And they built it like that on purpose. The cross on a map is from the Knights Templar. It shows you the secret. The fleur-de-lis up here at the top. And by the way, there are 32, 33 points here. This is called a rose compass. Remember what rose meant? It was a symbol for secrecy. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my what? Secret place. Now we know what it means. Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, what goes on upon its belly? A serpent. Them shall ye not what? Why? Because they creepeth. And Jude warned us, for certain men crept in where? 
What did they do? They slithered in. He was talking about the false prophets of the last days, folks. And they've crept in unawares into our churches and our denominations, haven't they? Wow. God said, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with divers what? He said, Don't mingle the seeds in the vineyard. Look at that. I am the vine, ye are the branches. It's DNA. Know ye not that you're the temple of God? Uh, and that if any man does what? Defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Jude warned that these guys would defile the flesh. Psalm 139, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. In thy book all my members were written. Now, this is God's book. And last night we found out, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Two rules concerning the book that God wrote. You cannot add to it, you cannot take away from it. So when they mingle themselves with the seed of men, that is the ultimate adding to God's word, isn't it? Makes sense, doesn't it? God said, don't do it. And why did he say, by the way, if they can mingle and mess up this book, then they're on the way to this one. If they change my DNA, they change the creature. So what happened when they started changing the Bible? The Bible is the DNA of the church. It's its life, isn't it? The Bible determines what the church is. And so when they started changing the DNA of the church, they changed the church. Wow. You know the secret, don't you? And how dangerous is this? Animal-human hybrids spark controversy. Genetic scientists right now, guess what they're working on? They're working on ways to change the human DNA by adding beast... DNA. Clone pigs modified for use in human transplants. Animal-human hybrids, embryos, a reality. Is this cow an animal-human hybrid? This, I found this this morning. Creation of genetically modified monkey heralds health revolution. Why would they try to change your DNA? Because your grandma has Parkinson's disease, and they can cure that now if they can change her DNA by adding a piece of monkey DNA in where her defective DNA is. But now she's not your grandma. She is a beast. Because if it's not all human, it's not human. Amen. And if it's not all the Bible, it's not the Bible. Right. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Transhumanism. This is the New Age movement. The New Age movement teaches that, watch this, the gods are going to descend down to earth and they're going to bring man to his next phase of evolution. Transhuman, above human gods. Ye shall be as gods, part of the 46 words that the serpent spoke to Eve. Have you seen these symbols? The yin yang here, here, what's that? It's the next chromosome, isn't it? Hybrids mingled together. BMW advertisement. The yin yang. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they say a perfect balance. In a courthouse, there is a woman, a goddess, holding a pair of balances in her hand. Albert Pike says that's a Freemason symbol. It doesn't represent the equality of man. It represents the balance. The sons of God mingled together with the daughters of men. That's what it represents. And she's holding three fingers up. I'll tell you why tomorrow night. You've got to come tomorrow night. <laughs> tell me what you see. A Sprite can. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hybrid. Mingled together. What do you see? Fused together. Wow. What do you see? Fusion. The symbols fuse together. What do you see? If you drink that, you are loopy. <laughs> Amen. You see, the, you see them fuse together? Branding. And remember, these people are being led by familiar spirits, aren't they? Okay? Synergy. You know what that means? 
Two things that cannot exist without each other. They, they join together so they can work together properly. That's what synergy is. And this concept is in the New Age movement, and now it's moving into the church. This is synergy, First Baptist Church in Tulsa. See the symbols? One pointing up, one pointing down. Guess what? Sons of God, daughters of men. The Synergy Church, a strategy for integrating small groups and Sunday school. Synergy Student Ministries. What do we have here? Gillette Fusion. See the symbol? Fuse together. Fusion Church. Better together. You get it? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And see this? I'm going to tell you what it means tomorrow night. You're close. You're very close to knowing what it is. Free will Baptist Sunday School literature. The New Age movement is moving into every facet of Christianity. Then the Pentecostal charismatic movement and the latter rain movement, the Elijah movement, the dreams and vision movement. Here's a group that promotes that. And they have a book called Your Unique DNA and Your Belief System Hold the Keys to Success. They're telling you that the secret to living the abundant life of Christianity is in your DNA. That's scary. Here's a book called The Secret. Have you heard of that? Book and a video called The Secret, marketed to business executives. It's called The Law of Attraction. It's actually witchcraft. It says that if you speak the right words and have the right positive thoughts, then by magic, those things will come to you. If you want to be rich, then you speak wealth out of your mind. That's called the law of attraction. The law of attraction actually has to do with the secret. Because in order for these gods to descend upon mankind and mingle themselves, man has to ask for it. You see, the, be the false prophet doesn't make everybody receive the mark. He causes them. They do it of their own free will. Two men are standing before the Israelites. One is the Son of God. The other one is the Son of the Devil. He is Barabbas. He is a murderer. He is pulled out of prison. Do you get it? The beast rise, rises up out of prison, doesn't he? And Pilate said, choose. Wow. So you know what the law of attraction is. It's witchcraft. So who said this? You have to begin speaking words of faith over your life. Your words have enormous creative power. The moment you speak something out, you give birth to it. This is a spiritual principle, and it works whether what you're saying is good or bad, positive or negative. Who said that? Take your pick. They both believe it. Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers, who lives in my county, practicing sorcerers. And they're leading millions of people and to receiving a mark on the right hand or forehead. Let me hear you say amen. amen. Here is uh, in the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, which is everything God told the Jews not to learn from the Canaanites that they learned, they incorporated into the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah has a principle called Adam Kadmon, which is the new human. A God human. And they talk about full DNA activation. This is all through the New Age movement where they say in, in the New Age, when we turn ourselves into gods, we're going to activate our DNA. Guess what they're referring to? Spiritual DNA. This is from a, a pastor's magazine. Talking about spiritual DNA. He says, I am no longer merely confess that I am the righteousness of Christ. I realize that with his DNA in me through his blood, I could be nothing else. I realize the attributes of his DNA reside in me, whether dormant or active. He is teaching people that what the Gnostics taught everybody is that they have a God on the inside of them. And if they perform the right rituals, this God will come out of them and they will be gods. New Age terms, Reformation, Synchronicity, Great Awakening, Tuning In, Transformation, Community, Connectedness, Entry Point, Paradigm Shift, Synergy, Center Point, Guided Imagery, Imagination, Convergence, Elevation of Man. These are all New Age terms. These are all these terms are in the church right now. All of them. Paradigm Shift refers to the day when man becomes God on this earth and becomes immortal. That's the day when they seed themselves with the seed of men. 
And so there's a conference coming up called SHIFT. It refers to the paradigm shift. These are the leaders of the emerging church that I warned you about two years ago. They're leading everybody into this new age concept. This guy is speaking at the Free Will Baptist D6 conference this September. And he believes in the coming paradigm shift. What does he believe in? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. One of their speakers, Brian McLaren, said, We are in a time of transition. Rethinking, reimagining, reenvisioning. A time for asking new questions and seeking answers that are both new and old, fresh and seasoned, surprising and familiar. What does it mean in today's world to be a follower of God in the way of Jesus Christ? He's taking people to the paradigm shift. Take a look at this symbol for a minute and tell me what you see. Do you see the secret? Connection. Sons of God, daughters of men. This is Connection Church. Leonard Sweet and Rick Warren. Leonard Sweet is a New Ager posing as a Christian. Rick Warren supports this guy. Leonard Sweet wrote a book called Quantum Christianity. And in it, he endorses the union of the human and the divine. And he calls it Kundalini's fire. Remember what Kundalini was? The serpent coiling up your spine, giving you enlightenment. How many of you believe in aliens, UFOs? I don't believe in beings from other planets. I believe in devils. And guess what the whole alien thing is about? New Ager Jack Purcell channeling a spirit called Lazarus says, We want to talk to you of love. This is the aliens talking. We want to talk to you of love. We want to blend with you. We want to blend our energy with yours so we can touch each other, so we can work together. That's synergy. That's connection. New Age mystic Ken Carey channeling angels. He says, we are here to merge. To blend with your human egos. To help your race become the central guidance system of a vast new being. You ever seen this TV show? Heroes. It's about people who have different DNA than you and I. And they are gods. You know this name heroes, you know where it came from? It came from Greek mythology. The heroes were the offspring of the gods who mated with human women. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. How many of you believe it so far? John Mack wrote a book on alien abductions. He said a new life form must evolve if the human biological and spiritual essence is to be preserved. It is difficult to ignore the fact that the UFO abduction phenomenon is taking place in the context of a planetary crisis of major proportions. Abductions seem to be concerned primarily with two related projects. Changing human consciousness to prevent the destruction of the Earth's life and a joining of two species for the creation of a new evolutionary form. David Jacobs in The Secret Life said, all the evidence points to there, the aliens, being here to carry out a complex breeding experiment in which they seem to be working to create a hybrid species, a mix of human and alien characteristics. From Alienshift.com, once one person writes, they told me they were there on a mission, the aliens. They belonged to a brotherhood of civilizations with others from which they had received specific orders for our world. They pointed out that we have always been guided indirectly by certain great personalities, like Christ, who they believe, who have passed through our civilizations throughout history. These so-called masters, some approaching divinity, have always had contact with the extraterrestrials. I had a feeling that these beings had been, on, had been sent on a mission pertaining to the evolution of our planet. That's what the whole alien conspiracy is all about. It all ties in with the New Age movement and Freemasonry and everything else that we've talked about. Here's a movie out called The Day the Earth Stood Still. See the symbol? The fusion of the two. Do you know what it's about? It's about how the aliens come down and they're going to destroy our planet unless we change. Unless we evolve. You get it, don't you? That's what it's about. You know what genies are? Genies from Arabian myth are demons who can beget young on mankind. Genies 
were gods who mated with human women and produced the heroes of Arabian myth. Remember a movie? What was the theme song to this movie? A whole new world. Your kids did. Your grandkids did. They saw it. Now, this very quick... What time is it? What time is it? 12 o'clock. 9 o'clock? Good, because I'm almost done. We're going to go to the Bible now, just for a minute. I want you to think about this. They're all teaching. They're all teaching. The Freemasons, the New Agers, the UFO people, the, all the weirdos of the world. They're all teaching that the gods are going to descend upon mankind and help him to his next phase of evolution. That's what they're all... How many of you see that so far? You see that in everything we've seen. Guess what really is going to happen? These angels are not going to come down of their own free will. They're kicked out. Revelation chapter 12 tells you when this event's going to happen. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And it's at this time the New Agers are perceiving that when these angels, when they see these angels falling, they think they're floating down. But they're falling. And the New Age is teaching that when they come down, they're here to help us. That sounds like the government, right? Hi, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we have this stimulus money we would like to give you. That's when this is going to happen. How many, of you, how many of you get it so far? At least just a tiny piece of it, but you, you're pretty sure that that's what's going to happen. Okay, now I spent two hours telling you the secret and trying to make it make sense to you so that you can see it not only from the Bible, but you can understand that there doesn't seem to be a realm in our life right now that in some way is not trying to promote or market this concept to people. It's everywhere. It's even in the church. So your best, I mean your best way, I was going to say bet, but it's not a bet. Your best way is just to stick with the book. Because men lie. Some do it and they don't know about it. They're just, they're just ignorant. They just didn't know. I've preached things that I've gone, what in the world was I doing? But your best way is to just stick with the old book. You can't trust men. I told you that last night. can't trust men. And if you're sitting here tonight after two hours and you don't buy a thing I'm selling tonight, then I challenge you, go to the book and ask God, God, was my cogger telling the truth? And if, I, and if you find out that I'm not, and if I find out that I'm not, I will repent. Because I'm not about me. You ought to know that by now. I'm not about me. I'm about this. And, base, and the discovery of the greatest secret that mankind has held for 6,000 years. God reveals it all. So let me ask you a question. Let's get back to reality tonight. What is it that you're wanting to ask God? What is it that you're really wanting to know? You know what I think? You know what I always tell my people? See, I believe in the simplicity of Christ. If you go to these New Age churches, they will make it hard for you to attain this level of, of perfection that you think that you ought to get to as a Christian. You'll never reach it this side of heaven. Do you believe that? Say amen. You're not perfect now and haven't been perfect. You're not going to be perfect until we shed off this old flesh. But I try to keep things pretty simple for my church. I give them two things. Prayer and Bible reading. Prayer and Bible reading. So, Brother Mike, we're having a problem. You know, what, you know what I think you ought to do? I think you ought to pray and I think you ought to get in the Scriptures and, and you'll find the answer there. In fact, if you pray, God will lead you to the Scriptures and you'll find the answer there. How many believe that? That's, see, that's simple, isn't it? You don't, need, you don't need a bunch of psychology. You, you don't need the, the psychologist behind the pulpit telling you seven tips on how to be successful at this. You don't need that. You just need to pray and read your Bible. That's your thing. And so I'm asking you tonight, the greatest secret that mankind has ever tried to keep that it's not written down anywhere, God shows it in the Bible. So let me ask you, what is it that you, want, you would really like to know from God? What is it that you would really, really like to know from God? If you, God said, God said, He promised. 
Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Do we believe that? You pray, and then you read. And God will show you.
Matthew 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve Christ and man, as it is written. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Matthew 7, verse 15 to 23, verse 15 to 18. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies, as it is written, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Matthew 7 verse 19 to 20 Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Verse 21 of Matthew 7 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. As it is written, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 22 of Matthew 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? As it is written, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Matthew 7 verse 22 Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? As it is written, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall shew signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Verse 23 of Matthew 7 And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They profess that they know God, but in unbelief they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Amen.